Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, right. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Thank you, Mike, um, Graham, and organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, as Daniela mentioned, this is about the Pyros project, and the Pyros project was something that was undertaken um, through the RAMP initiative, and it, it had about 20 people whose names are listed here. And they did most of the hard work, so I'm, I'm really speaking on behalf, behalf of the hard work they did. I sort of just gave a little bit of direction to all the hard work that was happening. Um, and the, 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 the main idea then was to have uh, an open source modeling platform where you could do reproducible epidemiological modeling and you know we chose python as the language of choice um, so so first let me explain what pyros is so pyros is uh, a numerical library that offers an integrated platform for doing inference forecasts and for looking at non non-pharmaceutical interventions in structured epidemiological compartment model. So that's really the basic framework. We have a compartment model um, of essentially arbitrary complexity. It isn't a single model. It's rather a platform in which you can build your own model and do inference. That's fitting your model to data, do forecasts, do various kinds of non-pharmaceutical non interventions and so on. So unlike some of the other talks that we've seen where the basic um, sort, of, uh, sort of organizing principle is the agent, and you know the agent has a certain dynamics here. The basic organizing principle is the compartment, which is a collection or is a subset of the population which has a certain attribute. Okay, so this was built uh, um, over the summer of 2020 when the epidemic was sort of just raging and we, none of us were professional epidemiologists. My own background is in statistical physics and the involvement of most of the people who contributed to this was also from statistical physics, essentially with most of the soft matter group and some, some, um, some, some contributors from the Department of Chemistry were the ones involved. Um, we spoke to a lot of the professional epidemiologists, including Daniela, and so you know, we got some um, very useful input from them. Of course, the errors that remain are ours and not attributed to them. Um, and what was nice is that this group could come up with something which we felt was usable. And you know, in, in, in sort of autumn of 2020, we actually used it to look at real data. So you know, in a space of about four or five months. And it turns out that you know, this model is being used by others. We don't quite know who it's being used by because we haven't seen citations. But if you look at the number of downloads that this model has, it's about 27,000 downloads on GitHub. So you know, people are clearly using it. And that makes us um, happy that you know, at least there's something that's gone beyond our own little group for, for this um, software. Um, OK, so I want to explain the philosophy by which we have designed this, um, this modeling tool. And it's really the Bayesian philosophy where you have a data set, let's say x, and you know there are a family of models, which I'm calling mi. And what you want to do, of course, is take your model and fit it to data and your model typically has a set of parameters. And then, of course, you get a posterior probability. Once you've done the Bayesian fitting, you get a posterior probability for these parameters, given the models. And of course, there is not one model which would fit the data. You know, there's a whole multitude of models. And that's why we see so much of variety in epidemiology that you know, there, there are many kinds of models which would fit the data. So you want to, in some sense, select these models from you know, the families that are available. And of course, the way one does the selection can be quite uh, subjective as well. But within this Bayesian framework, there's an objective way of doing model selection, which is you compute how likely the model is given the data. So that's there's a way of selecting models. And of course, once you've chosen your model, you can then use that model to forecast into the future. And that's this step where you have P of X star which is the future conditioned on what you've observed, which is the data. And once you've done a forecast, you might want to do an intervention. You might want to say, well, you know, there are too many infections happening. I want to impose a lockdown in terms of some sort of um, reduction in contact rates and so on. And so you do an intervention. And then, of course, you can either gather more data to see how, how that model, how, how the, the predictions of the model uh, sort of match against future data or you can build new models and then you sort of repeat this loop. 
Now, this is the general modeling loop in any discipline, and of course, it will it will apply to epidemiology as well. What we were trying to do was to make this loop as quick as possible. So, you know, there was we were we were sort of um, faced with this situation when you know there was new data. The data was changing fairly rapidly, and you know the models that we wanted to build had to be adapted to the data. So, we wanted to make sure that you know this loop could be uh, done reproducibly, efficiently, and you know as error free as possible. So that was the idea, sort of the main idea behind which we um, thought of designing Pyros. And you know, just to sort of make this a little bit more clear, these were the sort of key design principles. You know, first we wanted to provide the user a platform to build epidemiological compartment models using a domain-specific language. So we didn't want sort of detailed coding. We just wanted to say, well, you've thought of a model. How's the quickest way you can turn it into code? So there's a domain-specific language, which I'll show you in just a bit. Um, built into Pyros, which makes this quite rapid. So, you know, that's for rapid model building. We also wanted to integrate the model building with the model fitting. So once you've built the model within Pyros, you can use and you've, you know, you've given the data that you want to fit this model to. Uh, the process of model fitting is completely automatic. So there's no further sort of code that one has to write. It's just a little call that you have to do and the model is fitted to the data. So this allows one to do rapid inference and because you can now do this Bayesian model comparison, you can implement you know, the, the principle of parsimony, which says that you want to choose the models which have uh, the best fit and the least number of parameters. So there's a way of um, implementing that. And you know, there's, of course, this whole idea of non-pharmaceutical non interventions, where you can alter, alter contact rate parameters once you've got a fitted model, and this can have implications on policy. And uh, the, the sort of very key idea and sort of key operating principles was but we only use open source research software engineering compliant code. So we wanted a software for reproducible research rather than just an in-house code, which um, only we knew how to use and perhaps to alter. Um, so as I said, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist. My background is in statistical physics. So we brought to bear certain influences and certain ideas that we were familiar with from other domains. Um, so the design principles were, uh, so, so, so far as the modeling is concerned, was really dictated by my prior experience with molecular dynamics software. Now what molecular dynamics software does is it solves Newton's equations, um, F equals MA. And it has an abstraction for how this is to be done. So forces derived from potentials. So there are these sort of modular bits where you have potentials. And then, of course, you can build hierarchical structures from particles. You can build a dumbbell from dumbbells. You can build polymers from polymers. You can build membranes. So there's this whole idea of hierarchies. And uh, you know these large molecular modeling toolkits are designed in this hierarchical fashion, where you can reuse one bit. Um, and so they don't have to repeatedly code the same thing over and over again. So we, we we took this abstraction that you know you can you can build hierarchies into your into your coding abstraction uh, so that you know these compartment models can be hierarchized within within Pyro. So you can have something as simple as the SIR model, or you can have something as complicated as a spatially distributed, geographically distributed um, compartment model with you know arbitrary epidemiological classes, and you know it's, it's built fairly hierarchically. So this was one idea that we we got from molecular modeling, and the idea the other idea that we got was from this very nice uh, Bayesian inference software called Stan, which integrates the definition of the statistical model with its Bayesian inference. So it has a domain specific language in which you specify your statistical model, and the Bayesian inference is done automatically. So this was another idea that we had imported, where in Pyros you define your epidemiological model, and the inference is done automatically. So these were sort of the two main influences. Um, so now let me come, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on how Pyros works. So I'll first talk about what the Pyros models are. And as I said, the basic modeling category in Pyros is the compartment. And the population is partitioned into mutually exclusive and exhaustive compartments. So that's the basic category. And the basic dynamics is that a bit of the population is transferred from one compartment to the other. So you have to specify the transition rates by which these happen. And so you put these two together. You first say, well, I'm going to take my population. I'm going to partition it into these kinds of compartments. And I'm going to define these kinds of transitions between them. And that, that gives you the epidemiological model that you have. So you know, although this seems simple, this idea is of sufficient generality and of sufficient 
uh, sort of fecundity that you can really build really complicated models using just two, these two ideas. Um, there's a general sort of broad partitioning on whether these transitions are deterministic or stochastic, and depending on whether they're, you know, depending on this case, you either have um, models which are defined by differential equations, so these are ordinary differential equation models, or by Markov chains when you have stochastic transitions. That's the sort of two broad categories. So let me just show you some examples of how this is, you know, this, this idea is implemented in Pyros. Um, and I'll just change over and look at some, show you some examples of what we do in Pyros. So what I'll first show you is how we build a model using this um, uh, abstraction or this little domain specific language. So as I said, there are two things that one needs to specify, what the classes are and what the transition rates are. And so here for, I'm coding the simplest SIR model with a few, few uh, sort of aid structures. So the I, S, I, and R are the three partitions of the population and there's further sub partitions with an index I, which might refer to the age or any other attribute. So you, you, there's this little language here, which does this. So you say, well, I have classes, I have two classes, S and I, and what happens to the S? Well, it can have a constant rate of growth, which is this term here. And, you know, there's an infection term, which is that term here. So you just say that, well, these are, so that sort of corresponds to these, these bits here. And then what happens to the I? Well, you have exactly two more terms and that, that's and sort of that really specifies the model. And the last term is kind of already implicit. It doesn't need, need uh, any specification. So you can sort of just build this little language here and then, you know, you can build more complicated things. I'll, I'll not go into the details, but you get the idea. Um, you know, so the, the structure of a epidemiological model is rather fixed because you can either have immigration, which is a term like this, you can have infection, which is a bilinear term typically, which needs an S and an I to join together. Um, or you can have recovery terms in which once you've acquired the disease, there's no further interaction with anybody else for you to progress through the disease stages. And you know that's why that's a linear term. So it, it doesn't involve pairs of individuals, just linear individuals, uh, just, just the individual itself. So you have these linear terms. So because the, the, the sort of basic transitions are rather structured, you know, the number of thing, possibilities here are not sort of unbounded, they're, they're finite. And I think we've got pretty much all the common ones encoded here in terms of these rules. So you can build your own model using this. And then, you know, you fix your parameters. And then once you've done that, it's as simple as saying, you define a model, you say Pyros, I want to do a deterministic simulation. You've got your model spec, you've got your parameters, and then you just run your model. And well, you get the well, well-known SIR curve. Okay, so this is, I'm just showing you this for the simplest example, uh, you know, you can build arbitrarily complicated models. Um, then you can, you can change the parameters a little bit if you want, get a different set of parameters, get a different set of curves and so on. Um, now, what is nice about Pyros is that this is just an ODE model. And this is the key call that one has to make, Pyros deterministic. If you wanted to simulate a Markov chain, which is this example notebook. Now the transitions are stochastic. So instead of having a deterministic model, we have a stochastic model where there's a probability that you make the transition rather than make it definitely. And this notebook is exactly the same as the previous notebook, except that there is just one line of change, which is Pyros becomes Pyros not stochastic rather than deterministic. And then instead of solving ODEs, it solves the Markov chain. So the model specification is exactly the same in both these instances. You just have to tell the software, do you want a, a deterministic simulation or a stochastic simulation? And then you, know, you can generate arbitrary numbers of samples. This is just one sample and you can see the little fluctuations that are there because this is a stochastic simulation rather than a deterministic one. So this is you know, the advantage of having this abstraction layer of how you build models and you can change the parameters as you did before. And so, you know, there's a similarity between the, the, between the stochastic and deterministic cases. That's because we have chosen it to be like that. But of course, if you dial the population size down, the stochasticity will be much larger and you will see significant differences between the uh, stochastic and deterministic cases. Okay, so, so this is how you build and run models. But of course, you want to then fit the models to data. So you want to do inference. 
Now, the way we do inference in Pyros is Bayesian as far as we can go. It tries to be completely Bayesian. There's some places where it can't be absolutely Bayesian. Um, but it's the, the key idea is that we want inference to be fast for reasonably large dimensional models, and we want to be able to compute the model evidence. Now, if we were to try to do this using Monte Carlo, it would be not really feasible. I mean, or it, it would be much slower than um, the method that we have adopted. So our key idea here is that instead of using the exact likelihood for the Markov population, population process through which, you know, these models are, uh, which you know, the, the population process, which is defined by the model that the user has constructed, we use an approximation, which is good for large population sizes. So for large population sizes, the, 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 the likelihood can be approximated by a simpler likelihood, which is Gaussian. And this is based on uh, a functional central limit theorem. So it's just a generalization of the idea that um, just like you add a whole lot of random variables and with you know, those random variables are well, well behaved, then the sum becomes a Gaussian random variable. So there's a similar theorem for random processes. So if you have a collection of random processes and you know they're reasonably well behaved, once you add them together, they become a Gaussian process. And it's really that idea that we take because in most of the situations, other than the very early and very late stages of the epidemic, the, the number of in infected individuals is large and you know this limit theorem applies. And we have, instead of the exact likelihood, which is very difficult to compute, we can compute an approximation by a Gaussian process. Now, once we have a Gaussian process, then inference can be reduced to optimization, which is relatively cheap, rather than having to do Monte Carlo, which is relatively ex expensive. And it's this approximation which allows us to evaluate the Bayesian evidence of a model so that one can do model comparison in a tractable fa fashion. And, um, you know, of course, I haven't surveyed all the epidemiological codes out there, but I think to the best of our knowledge, this is fairly unique to Pyros that, you know, we can do model compar comparison in, in realistic models um, with, you know, 30 to 40 parameters. Um, so I'll just show you an example of how inference is done. I have to go back to this. And so we're going to do inference. So the way we, we did inference, this is, this is of course, um, on simulated data. It's not on real data. And I'll show you a real data example in just a bit. But um, what we do is we first define a model. So in this case, it's um, an S SIR model with several kinds of infected classes. So there's an asymptomatic infected class and a symptomatic infected class, and you run a model epidemic okay, till, till the epidemic has died out. And then you define using this model building class. Um, uh, uh, so you sort of define this model. You say that their, their class is S, IA, and IS, and you define the transitions between them. And what you do is then you take your data from this simulation, you take your model defined here, you put them together in this inference tool, which says that I have my inference parameters M and N, and then you do your estimation. And you can then ask for this fitted model, what's the future going to look like? And the answer is given here. So I can just blow that up a little bit. So that's the true number of susceptibles. By true, we mean what was generated by the model. That's the true number of asympt asympt asymptomatic individuals, infected individuals. Um, and you can then compare these numbers with what you get from the model that was fitted using data from this, this bit of the time window. So we just use this bit of the time window to fit the model and then we forecast using the model and you can see that it agrees quite well so this is this is very simple it's just we know the model we know we know what model generated the data and we're fitting exactly the same model to that data so this is really just a self self consistency check that this works properly and uh, we can we can sort of do some fun things which we did fairly early on which was that we took covid sim and I think um, our colleagues in Edinburgh helped us with this in actually running COVID sim, which is a large agent-based model with about a thousand parameters and you know several million degrees of freedom. And this is um, Mike 
uh, my kids came up with this name Simulana, which is an imagined country where epidemics are correctly described by the COVID sim code. And we ran that code and then we asked, well, can we infer what's going to happen in the future, provided we've only been given a slight small time time window of COVID sim data, which is again the blue window there. And you know, again here, of course, COVID sim is an agent-based model. Here we're trying to fit a compartment model to it. And you know, there's a lot of choice that one can make. We used something which seemed reasonable, which was a five-stage I model. And we had multiple stages so that we could include the fact that the, the infection, the residence times are not exponential. So in a single compartment epidemiological models, the residence times become exponential. If you have more stages, they become non-exponential. And real life is better described by that. And this is 10 parameters and about 10 degrees of freedom. And you can see the fit is not bad. OK, it's reasonably good. So there's a great degree of compression that one can make in terms of model reduction if you look at these um, compartment models. So let me get back now to uh, get out of this. To be stuck. Um, okay, so <laughs> I need to get out of this. Yes, okay. I'll just get back. So, okay, what I've shown you is that we can do inference self consistently within our own family of models. We can infer from agent based models. And now I really want to go over to the case of inferring from real life data, but I just want one. Uh, so draw your attention to one point which we feel was a bit of an innovation for virus which is this that um, when we are doing when we are actually fitting our models to data of course there's the epidemiological model which is the generative model which is sort of the the real dynamics of the epidemic and of course there's the observation which is when we are sort of doing a testing we're finding out how many people are there in each class now of course if we had perfect testing there would be no reason to distinguish between the generative model and the observations. You have exactly the same state of knowledge as the dynamical variables in your problem. But of course, that's not the case. Testing is imperfect. So if you test you know, and say that, well, there are 100 infected people in the population, that may actually be a fraction of the true fraction of the number of infected. So what we did was the way we implemented this model fitting when it came to real life data was that we had a generative epidemiological layer and that generative epidemiological layer led to transitions, which were observations. And the difference between the S, I, and R here and the S, Q, I, Q, and R, Q here are because of the imperfection of the testing process, okay? Or any other process which leads to a difference between the true state of the dynamical variable and your observation of it. So this is the, the way we actually fit our models to data through this um, observation layer. And what we did was uh, we applied it to look at what happened in late 2020. And uh, a, the, the results are in this paper, Bayesian inference across multiple models suggests a strong increase in lethality of COVID-19 in 2020 in the UK. And what we did was we looked at a family of models um, which had a change in the IFR and didn't have a change in the IFR. So these were the sort of two families of models that we compared. And you can see that all of these models fit reasonably well the actual data. Now, just by the eye, it's kind of difficult to tell you know, whether there's evidence for or against these models. But if we now do the systematic Bayesian evidence calculation, we can actually tell, and I haven't shown you that because there's a lot of technical details, which I'll, I'll just be keen to avoid, but there is actually positive, that there is actually more evidence for the change in the IFR within these family of models again, than there is for, not, for, for no change in IFR. So these models, the models in which there is no infection, uh, change in the IFR, that's models A0, B0, and C0, have lower Bayesian evidence than the models which have change A1, B1, C1, and A2. So, Okay, so that is just to show you that we can really apply it to fairly complicated models, to real life data. And, you know, so this fairly basic structure of the compartment and its transitions is, uh, you know, it's nice. It, you can do a lot of things with it. So in terms of the future, what we're doing is, of course, we've had a sort of 
um, all our volunteers are no longer there. So it's really, um, you know, the, the, the people who, who are still interested are really doing things like housekeeping, which is, you know, better documentation, more unit tests, trying to optimize the performance. What I would really like to do is to add some element of behavioral dynamics in these models. So, you know, some sort of game theoretic marriage of some sort of game theoretic and epidemiological models. And there's there's a summer intern who's going to work on this this year. It's fund, uh, funded by the Gatsby Foundation. And we hope that we can get some more funding from Microsoft, who were very generous in the beginning uh, with funding. And, you know, there's some um, partners, other industry partners who are also interested in epidemiological modeling for um, reasons related to the financial markets. And we hope that they'll also be interested in contributing uh, to this. Um, I just want to end with this slide, which I think kind of um, really summarizes the philosophy of Pyros, you know, and Steve Jobs had rather famously said that what a computer is to me is the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. It's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. And what we hope Pyros will be is a bicycle for the minds of epidemiological modelers. It'll help you to get from model to prediction rather quickly. Um, and I hope that you'll just give it a spin if you can. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Joy, for keeping uh, um, on time. You uh, we've got a few minutes for for questions, so I'm going to to um, to see what the questions are. Um, anyone who might want to, I, I haven't seen any hands yet. Um, Ian, do you? Okay, I, I think I, I would prefer to ask you to ask your question directly rather than writing it down and, and me reading it, please. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, it's really, uh, really interesting stuff. Obviously, I'm a little familiar with it. Um, let me see. The, the comparison you did of the several models against real data is, yep. is, is really cool. And um, looking at the, uh, the evidence, in that, I know you have modeled the sort of the observation process to be a little bit sort of, you know, incomplete or noisy and stuff. But uh, within this, I think you're still assuming that each model is perfectly sort of true. Like, you know, each model type is sort of accurate aside from the observation process. So the problem is with, with evidence calculations is they're quite sensitive. So they will always pick a model that's just a bit closer to the data. I just wondered if you'd explored the robustness of your conclusions if you assumed each of those models are sort of not quite true, because of course, none of them are true, really. So if you built in just a little bit of extra leeway or uncertainty, would that make the, the calculation a little bit different or would it still have the same sort of strong conclusions? So I'm a little unclear about when, how, how do you, um, in, in do, do you mean the model priors or? No, the model structure itself. I mean, you're conditioning on a model structure, which is yes. uh, when well, now you're comparing to real data. Yeah. So we know the model structure. Uh, sorry, my, my background is, is, is sort of UQ Bayesian stuff. So we always build in a model uncertainty itself because yeah, we know no, the no, model, no. E even no. given the precise parameters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is conditioned on a structure which is not true in itself. That's and so true. we just want to guard against two strong statements against that conditioning on the model structure per se. I, it's no, not that I don't like what you're doing. I'm just wondering about the sensitivity and robustness of, of no, that. So we, we, yeah, so thanks, thank you. Thank you for raising that point. We have not really included that. I mean, so the, the structural uncertainty is kind of put in in an ad hoc way that, you know, we have several kinds of models in which there is no IFR change. There are several kinds of models in which there is no, there is IFR change, all right? And the sensitivity analysis is done entirely in terms of the parameters. So it's just parameter sensitive analysis, but you know this whole idea of having a, a, a sort of uncertain model itself, which you know one might do when we're doing Bayesian nets, for instance, where you you don't know the the the, the network structure, the structure, the network itself is uncertain. That is something that we've not done, and I I agree that you know that's something that ought to be done, and perhaps will lead to different conclusions. But I wouldn't hazard a guess at this point in time. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And any more questions? Hi, uh, Ronaldo. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, Hi, I just I was wondering about the optimal intervention that you are exploring. Does your software support some sort of dynamic programming to do that, like in an optimal control fashion? It is supposed it that was the goal. So it is supposed to do some sort of optimal control on the intervention itself. But you know, that is the least developed feature. So I mean that's right. something that we kind of didn't finish doing. So if you sort of look at the 
um, uh, examples, there is something called control. Okay. And you know, there are some, there is an optimal, there's one notebook which has got optimal control in it, but you know, it, it, it needs work. So. All right, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I have, a, have a question, a, a very generic one. I mean, you, 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 you've shown some initial results and some, some, some results from um, uh, fit into real data, but I don't see any uncertainty. Ah, no, there, there is uncertainty quantification. I just haven't shown okay. you any uncertainties. Yeah, so the uncertainties are, in fact, if you look at the, uh, let's see if you can see that there. So that's, for instance, uncertainty. So you know these are multiple trajectories. So if you if you really wanted to con uh, you know sort of obtain the uncertainty of the forecast, you could just you know draw the 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 confidence intervals around these things. So we do repeated stochastic sampling to get the uncertainties. Okay, and in there, the there. Case, sorry, in the case of a, of, of real data. In the example so, of the real data. Yeah. So in the case of real data, of course, these again, the example that I sh the these are really the the map estimates of the data. Yes. Yes. So you can of course draw all of the error bars around it as well. But you know, since there are already so many models, it would have become extremely. Okay. Clever. So in this sense. Okay. Fine. Um, is there anyone else who might be interesting in asking question? No. It's very shy audience. Thank you very much, John. Thanks a lot. Uh, we